This video is sponsored by Skillshare. It's no secret that wildfires are becoming bigger, more severe. They're burning for longer and are becoming more destructive. This is the reality of life in a hotter, drier, climate-ravaged world. Each year, thousands of acres of forest are burned, millions of dollars worth of possessions are destroyed, precious lives are lost, and countless more are put in danger. It might be easier to think of these wildfires as natural disasters, as something that we have no control over and that we must simply learn to live with. But the reality is that they're anything but natural. Our actions as humans have contributed to a hotter, drier environment for these fires to form. Our management of fires has caused more fuel to build up. And the way we've built our cities has put more homes and more people in the most fire-prone areas. Of course, that also means we, as humans, can play a role in solving this problem. And there are any number of efforts we can undertake to tackle the issue of wildfires, the impact they have on our lives, and the impact they have on the natural world. Today, I want to share with you one such effort. I want to share it with you because, as I see it, it's emblematic of the sorts of modern environmental issues we are facing, where our actions have resulted in threats not only to our lives, but to the lives of the countless species we share our home with, and how we can play a role in reversing those actions. This is a story as much about us as it is about the natural world. We are, after all, part of that world, and we can have a say in making sure it stays that way. So today, I want to tell you about a tree called the giant sequoia, a species that, for its entire history, has been dependent on fire for its survival, but whose survival is now threatened by those very same flames. To start off this story, I want to tell you a little bit about my own personal relationship with big trees. It all started during a family vacation to California. I had just graduated high school and was heading off to college at the end of the summer. There was a lot of uncertainty. I had never lived on my own before and was unsure of where I was headed in life or what my next chapter held. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I remember being on that trip and seeing a coastal redwood for the first time. The tallest trees in the world. I was awestruck. I was humbled. Here I was, with all of my issues and insecurities amidst this forest of giants thousands of years older than I was. They reminded me of my place in the world and instantly radiated a feeling of stability and security. Now, I wish I could tell you that big trees solved all of my problems. They didn't. I still deal with all of these issues to this day. But if I ever need that feeling of stability and security, I think about the big trees. I go and visit the big trees. I can't imagine my life without big trees. And there are no bigger trees in the world than the giant sequoias. By volume, giant sequoias are the largest trees on the planet. They are stately, they are regal, they are magnificent. The most famous ones actually get names. Known as monarchs, here are a couple of my favorites. You've got General Grant, the Grizzly Giant, Genesis, King Arthur, one is just named Column, another one President, and the largest of them all is General Sherman. Let me give you a few facts about Ol' Sherm for some perspective. Located in the giant forest of Sequoia National Park, it is nearly 275 feet, or 83 meters tall, almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty. It is 103 feet around at its base, 31 meters. My wingspan is 5 feet 6 inches, which means you would need almost 20 of me to give General Sherman a hug. It weighs more than 4.6 million pounds, more than 2 million kilograms. That's 15 blue whales, 
the largest animal to ever exist on planet Earth. But what I find most impressive is simply how wide it actually is. At its base, General Sherman is 36.6 feet wide, 11 meters. You could fit two Honda Accords with room to spare across the trunk of this tree. They are incredible, monarchs of the forest, giants of our time. But they're rare, super rare, actually. Some estimates say that there may only be 75,000 left on the entire planet. They're listed as endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The reason for this is that their habitat requirements are super specific. There's about 48,000 acres of giant sequoia groves on Earth, only about the size of Cleveland, Ohio. They need moist, humid environments, not too hot, not too cold. They need good soil and an open understory to reproduce. This means that giant sequoias only exist in about 75 distinct groves on the western slope of California's Sierra Nevada mountains at elevations from 4,000 to 8,000 feet, roughly 1,200 to 2,400 meters. From the northernmost grove to the southern is less than 300 linear miles. Less than 500 kilometers separates the entire range of the species. Whether you find them in a national park like Sequoia, Kings Canyon, or Yosemite, a national forest like the Sequoia or Sierra, or a state park like Calaveras Big Trees, or through Native American stewardship, or through an educational institution. The point is, most sequoias lie within protected areas. But as we'll see, that might not be enough. You have to admire their resilience, though. They've basically built a career, so to speak, on being tough. How tough are you? How tough am I? How tough am I? I had a bowl of nails for breakfast this morning. <laughs> yes, so? Without any milk. Despite all of the constraints they face with their habitat requirements and the specific conditions they require to reproduce, and the threats they once faced from industrial logging, these trees have found a way to survive. Thrive, even. They aren't the biggest trees in the world after all. Here's why. They grow for a long time and they grow very quickly. Giant sequoias can live to be over 3,000 years old, making them one of the longest lived trees in the world. And in the right conditions, seedlings can grow over two feet per year. So they get up into the canopy very quickly and they stay there for a long time. And because they do grow so big, they don't get blown over in the wind very easily. Also, their heartwood, which is the wood in the center of the tree that helps stabilize them, it gets pumped full of these chemicals called tannins, which are resistant to rotting and help ward off pests. They have this kind of self-reinforcing stability mechanism. It's no wonder they become giants. They also have super thick bark, like several feet worth. This also helps with resistance to pests, but is more important with resistance to fire which is the entire reason I wanted to make this episode. The lessons we learn from sequoia conservation and their fire adaptations can be applied to our own relationship with fire. They can help us build more resilient communities and manage our forests better. See, sequoias and fire go hand in hand. Sequoias quite literally would not exist without fire. They are fire adapted, but they are fire adapted to different types of fires than the kinds we see today. These giant hellish conflagrations are not what giant sequoias like to see. No, they prefer smaller ground level fires for a few reasons. For one thing, giant sequoias have what are called serotonous cones. Their cones, and the seeds inside of them, rely mostly on fire to open up. The heat from the flames dries out the cones and allows the seeds to drop to the forest floor to begin germination. Basically, fire is what triggers giant sequoias to begin reproducing. But the fire does another thing. See, giant sequoias are pretty picky. They require a nice, open understory with little competition from other trees. They don't like shade and need lots of sunlight to grow big and strong. Low-grade fires clear out duff and other debris on the forest floor clearing the way for the newly fallen sequoia seeds. Now, occasionally, a bigger fire would break out and this would help the sequoia since it would clear a large spot in the canopy for them to colonize. 
But to be clear, this was an occasional occurrence, not the giant yearly megafires we see today. Again, those are bad, not just for sequoias, but basically for the entire forest and for us. So here you have the giant sequoia, the most voluminous trees on Earth, adapted to live with fire. For millennia, this species has relied on fire to reproduce, to grow as big and as tall as it has, and to become this majestic icon of our forests. But now, fire threatens its very existence. The fires we are seeing today impact sequoias in several ways. For one thing, decades of fire suppression have led to a buildup of fuels on the forest floor. Those low-grade, ground-level fires that used to come through have been replaced by hellish megafires that use all of this fuel to basically climb into the canopy and cause widespread tree mortality. We call these crown fires and we call the overly crowded underbrush ladder fuels because they act like a ladder to reach the canopy where they cause crown fires and kill a bunch of trees. Whereas before, smaller fires would clear out the understory and help sequoias release their seeds, crown fires reach all the way to their leaves and branches and completely kill the tree. There are some more indirect impacts as well. Even if a fire doesn't reach the crown and kill a sequoia directly, it can still damage the tree and weaken it, leaving it susceptible to other threats. For example, sequoias aren't typically susceptible to pests like beetles. Their thick bark and tannin-rich heartwood protect against them. But sequoias weakened by fires are increasingly showing signs of beetle damage, an indication that repeated exposure to high-intensity fire is making giant sequoias susceptible to threats they otherwise are adapted to handle. Then you've got things like droughts. Giant sequoias require huge amounts of water to survive, and historically, they've relied on the immense snowpacks of the Sierra Nevada for these nourishing liquids. But with climate change reducing snowpacks and causing earlier meltouts, that water supply is becoming increasingly strained, which again weakens the sequoias and makes them susceptible to other threats. Which again, they have evolved to handle. Giant sequoias are adapted for fire. They rely on it. They are adapted to be pest resistant and drought resistant. But our actions are putting them under threat. The very thing these sequoias rely on to survive is now the very thing threatening their survival. But don't just take my word for it. Let's take a look at some of the data. According to the National Park Service, between 2015 and 2021, 85% of all giant sequoia acreage in their native range was burned. That number is only 25% for the entire 20th century. Think about that. More sequoia acreage burned in six years than for the entire preceding century. Just two fires alone, the 2020 Castle Fire and the 2021 KNP Complex, killed between 13 and 19% of all large sequoias in the Sierra Nevada. That's somewhere between 8,000 and 12,000 trees. And remember, there are only roughly 75,000 of these trees in the entire world. That is a significant number of dead trees. It's looking rough out there for our giant friends, but there are steps being taken to help ensure their survival. More immediately, these include measures you've probably already seen. Trees are being wrapped in a special tinfoil to deflect heat and repel embers away from the base of the trees. This foil is actually especially made for structures and houses, but it works just as well for trees. It has Kevlar and carbon fiber imbued into it to increase its heat resistance. In addition to foils, entire areas around trees are cleared of understory debris and duff to prevent them from becoming ladder fuels. Trees are also sometimes coated in flame retardant or foam. Sprinklers are installed to keep trees moist and increase the humidity around them. But these are emergency measures. Last gasp steps employed when fires have already broken out and are imminently threatening the giant sequoias. Even then, these measures are really only pulled out for so-called important trees like General Sherman or Grizzly Giant. The thousands of other sequoias threatened by wildfires are not so lucky. Nor is that practical. You can't wrap an entire species in tinfoil. 
No, to protect them and to protect this species, we'll need some more long-term solutions. Paradoxically, one of the most important solutions is, in fact, fire. See, to mimic historical fire regimes, those low-intensity ground fires, land managers employ something called a prescribed burn. This is a fire set on purpose that is designed to clear out fuels and provide the sequoias with that much-needed open understory. Native American tribes had actually been practicing this type of forest management for centuries before our modern fire suppression policies were enacted. I actually have a whole video about how prescribed burns work and our history of fire suppression. I'll link it in the description. But anyway, these prescribed burns will be key to future sequoia health because they mimic the types of fires that they have traditionally relied on to survive. Not the mega fires of today, but the small fires of the past. If we can do that, if we can bring the giant forests back into a state they have historically thrived in, then the giant sequoias have a chance. And we have a chance. Like giant sequoias, humans also don't like giant hellacious megafires. We can avoid the unnecessary loss of life and property, and we can repair an ecosystem we've had a hand in destroying. It's a win-win for us and for the sequoias. Okay guys, thanks for watching and thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So as you know, this entire channel is dedicated to online learning. I want to make parks and conservation education as accessible as possible online. And everything I do to make these videos, I learned online. So when I got the opportunity to work with Skillshare, it was a no brainer. They have thousands of classes for people who want to learn something new and explore their own creativity. Personally, I've been enjoying a couple of classes from two creators I really admire. Thomas Daher, a creative and editor from Yes Theory, has a course on creating engaging stories for YouTube. And Nathaniel Drew has a course on speaking confidently on camera. I've honestly just been terrified of this since I started creating on YouTube, and Nathaniel's course is helping me work past that and invest in myself and in the future of this channel. Everything on Skillshare is ad-free and new premium courses are launched each week. So if you're ready to learn something new and invest in yourself, the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will receive one month of Skillshare for free. I think you'll find it well worth it. Thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more park stories. I also am on Patreon now so you can join my Discord, vote on video topics, and join my book club. You can also get your name in the credits. Head to patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries to find out more. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.